Good morning and welcome. Whether you are regular or online or you're here for the first time, we want you to know that we really appreciate you joining us here this morning for worship at First Christian Church of Atlanta. Now please stand as you're able for our opening hymn, number 33, How Great Thou Art, verses 1 and 4. care what the weather's going to be like outside. It's a great day to be here in the Lord's house and to worship. And uh, just to kind of get things kicked off, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Ann for just a minute. Ann, you have some musicians to introduce to us today? To uh, 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 welcome my friends who came to church for the first time to worship with us. So if you don't mind, we're there. The soprano, Mrs. Uh, Regina Lundy, and of course, Jake Nichols, and also my friend, uh, Jack Nichols' mom, Mrs. Nichols, and also Dr. Randy Dobbs is here to worship with us for the first time, and also the music guest magician, Mr. Nick Rodworld. And would you please join us in welcoming them? Thank you. We also have other first-time worshipers, and just to be clear, I'm not going to call you a guest. I'm not going to call you a visitor. We don't want you to feel like other than one of the family. So if you are worshiping with us for the first time, we hope and pray that you will feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. We hope and pray that you will feel blessed and that you have had an experience of worship in the presence of God and in the presence of God's people. I will also let you know that in the back center behind uh, those two very handsome looking people, John Blasley and Mary Bowen, is a little table with, some, with a tray that has these disposable communion cups. So because of COVID and we're wearing masks and we're keeping social distancing and so on, we are also taking the Lord's Supper with uh, these disposable cups. But we do partake every Sunday. It's part of our practice. I'm also happy to announce that yesterday we had a nice work 
crew come. We have now moved the nursery upstairs and just slightly down the hall. So if you go straight out of the sanctuary, across the narthex, and through the double doors, right next to the bathrooms, we now have an upstairs nursery. We are ready to have families with children. And I want to give special thanks to Sean and Travis Stone, Marsha Moore, Mandy Dixon, and would you believe Jeannie Morgan was here helping us yesterday to move furniture and to get the nursery ready. Uh, we also had to move the AA group down the hall, but they were willing and they also gave us a hand and it was a good day of that. Uh, one other announcement that didn't make it to the announcements, but you'll see some announcements scrolling before and after the service. Um, uh, Linda McDaniel, who's not able to be with us today, she's one of our deacons, and she is also going to be doing a cookie walk at our Tucker Day exhibit uh, in a few weeks. She is asking if we would have people donate cookies. Just bring them to the church and leave them in the <coughs> narthex, and we will collect them, and she will use that as one of our uh, outreaches. In case you haven't heard, Tucker Day is September the 4th. It's all day long here in the city of Tucker. And we, First Christian Church, are in charge of the kids' zone. And so we're going to have all kinds of games and activities. We'll have an information booth. We're going to tell the people of Tucker about our wonderful congregation. We're going to invite them to come. And now we are setting up all the responses we need. What happens when people show up for church? We're ready. What happens when they come with children? We're ready. We have a nursery that's upstairs and, and close to the sanctuary. On September the 15th, Anna's going to begin a Wednesday evening program called Music and Mission for Young Singers, and it's going to be from 5.30 to 6.15. It'll be like a weekly version of the summer arts camp we did two years ago that was very, very well received. We're going to do a family fun night in October. We're going to have breakfast with Santa Claus in December and a Christmas pageant on December the 19th. So our goal, our plan is to reach families with children is to grow, not for the sake of growth, but for the sake of doing ministry and for the sake of reaching a new generation for Christ. Please make that a matter of prayer. And now this is our time of community prayer in which we as individuals, but also as a congregation, lift up to God our words of care and concern, but also our words of praise and gratitude. In the course of this prayer, I will say the following words. I will say, hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts. And this will be your opportunity to silently pray whatever you want to lift up to the Lord in, in prayer, both in terms of words of gratitude for blessings received, but also in terms of cares and concerns. Let us now go before the throne of our Heavenly Father and let us pray. Holy Wisdom, you granted Solomon's request for an understanding mind and the knowledge to discern good from evil. Fill us with such understanding and knowledge that we may act as instruments of your loving desire for creation, working with you to transform our conceit into concern for others, our fear into love, our violence into peace, and our brokenness into wholeness. In this moment of worship, as we, your people, are gathered here in this place, and as heaven and earth are joined, hear us as we pray from the silence of our hearts. And now, O oh Lord, hear us as we join together our hearts, our minds, and our voices in that prayer which you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is a time in our service when we would normally ask our deacons to come forward. But as we continue to practice social distancing, we have our offering plates in the back for you as you come in or when you leave. And mail, Margaret loves to check the mail and she enjoys it if you just stop by. Now we would ask God, please accept our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship to you. Multiply what we give for the growth of your kingdom. Amen. We now approach the time of the Lord's Supper. This for us is in many ways the crescendo or the pinnacle of worship. This is the time of the week where we gather about this table to remember Jesus who became flesh, who died, who was buried, but who God raised from the dead. And he instituted for us this Lord's Supper, which is symbolic or symbolized in the bread and the cup. Sometimes we need to remind ourselves that the way of Jesus is not supposed to be easy. At the best of times, Jesus will challenge our assumptions and draw us into places where we will learn and grow if we are willing. In the worst of times, we may be called upon to risk all that we have, including our lives, for our faith. In the Gospels, many people stopped following Jesus because they found the way to be just too difficult. It isn't easy, and the only way to live out our challenge is to draw on the words that Jesus spoke that our spirit and life for us. One of the places where we hear those words is here at the table, come, hear the words of life that Jesus is speaking to you. And now for the words of institution. For I have received of the Lord what I have also handed on to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time together as we come to your table and you help to renew and restore us as we drink the blood of Christ and uh, honor you. We pray for your blessings and we pray for our world. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. And now, if you would, to uh, peel back the top layer and to release the loaf, let us partake of the bread and remembrance of the body of our Lord Jesus.
And as you are able to peel back the second layer of the foil, let us partake the cup in remembrance of his blood. Anyone else need a cup? Whether from a chalice and fresh baked, baked bread or from a prepackaged disposable communion set, what we have done is we have been faithful to the wish command of our Lord in remembering his death, burial, and resurrection. And without words, each of us have proclaimed the gospel in this little meal. Praise be to God. And our scripture today is Acts 2, verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Thank you. 
beautiful choir, and uh, that was lovely. You notice what a larger uh, group we have here. Somebody's been doing a wonderful job of recruiting singers, and it sounds wonderful. And you guys uh, really blessed us today with that. Let me also say a word about Nick. Uh, I have to tell you, I played saxophone from sixth grade through 12th grade. And usually the words I got back from the band director were too loud, you know, control, get in tune or whatever. I'm being a little bit funny, but uh, you must really have a great sense of musicality, Nick, because you play the saxophone with such poise and control and such a uh, nice tone. And to me, that we're just talking, the two of us, everybody else can, can tune out for a second, but to me, the saxophone, the biggest problem with the saxophone is that it's easy to play, which means it's easy to play terribly. <laughs> to play that nicely. And so that was, a, that was a real blessing to us, and we really appreciate it for you sharing your talents with us today, playing the piano as well and singing. Nick, I believe you are religion, teacher of religion at Marist High School. So we're very blessed to have you with us today, as well as everyone else who is worshiping with us for the first time. Just uh, another word, we are practically at the end of my series of sermons about uh, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, but once again, we have this little red booklet and the table in the back of the sanctuary and some out in the narthex. Please feel free to take one. We have a copy for you if you'd like to have it. It's a very short read, and let's be honest, it's like a comic book. It has pictures. <laughs> but uh, it tells uh, in very simple terms who we are and what we are, but that's also kind of the point of the sermon series that I've been preaching from June, July, and August. And if, uh, if that interests you, feel free to go to our website, and on the pull-down menu, you see a, a one that says Messages. You can click on it, and you'll see a, sort of a graphic. Like today's graphic is, uh, you, can you show that just for a second, Saul? Portrait of a Congregation. You can see that. If you click on it, you can find the manuscript the actual manuscript that I'm preaching from, and later in the day, the video will be there. And of course, it, you can go all the way back to the earlier ones, and if, you know, uh, if, if this is a problem, just read the manuscripts, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you this question. What is the difference between a portrait and a picture? What is the difference between a portrait and a picture? Now, we snap pictures all the time. And in the, the days of cell phones and Facebook, let's be honest, we take way more pictures than we know what to do with, right? And it's always funny, you know, if you're looking around on Facebook, somebody's like, I'm eating a strawberry sundae today. And they take a picture like everybody cares, you know. And, but of course, if you look on my phone, I've got about 10 million pictures of our granddaughters uh, from, and, and I don't know what to do if I ever lose this phone. I guess maybe I'll just download them to the cloud or upload them to the cloud or whatever. I, now I sound like an old guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. Anyway, we take more pictures than we care to talk about, and such is the digital age in which we live. A picture, or let's say a photograph, captures a specific moment in time. Like if I were to take a picture of you right now, this would be you today, right? And we can look at a photograph of ourselves and we'll make observations about what was happening at that moment or how we feel about it. Like, oh, I was happy that day or, ooh, that was the day I had a really bad haircut, you know, something along that line. Don't look at that picture and tell me if I'm wrong, but I'll bet that every time you're in a group picture, the first thing you do is look for yourself. Yep. yep. That's just human nature, right? For a photograph, context is everything. Some of them embarrass us. You know, like the, the picture we have from when I'm six years old and I'm, my two front teeth are out and, you know, things like that. Portraits are something different. We sit for a portrait. We get dressed up for a portrait. We, we may even put on a particular costume. We dress up. Maybe there's a theme, you know, and sometimes families have these portraits where they, they have a theme and sometimes they love it and sometimes it's a source of friction in the family. We have school portraits. 
wedding portraits, and then we can think of portraits of famous people like that picture of George Washington that has the, you know, it's not completely finished at the bottom. You always see that in the movies and TV shows where there's a, a schoolroom and there's a picture of George Washington, right? Those famous pictures. So portraits are more like a historical chronicle in that they represent something more than just what's happening on that day. In many ways, a portrait wants to project a particular image or message. Uh, it tells a story. Hopefully, it tells an accurate story, and sometimes it doesn't. But in short, photos show the real us in a real moment in time. Portraits show an image that we probably want to project. Case in point, I'll have you know, I don't know how many of you uh, remember your, you know, your 10th uh, grade world history, but I am no fan of Oliver Cromwell. And I don't know if you remember Cromwell or not. Cromwell was the leader of the English Civil War. He was a Puritan. I did, I'm not a fan of his, but I will give him credit where credit is due. There is a very famous portrait of Cromwell that depicts a wart above his eye. I mean, it doesn't look all that terrible, but I mean, you know, let's just say that he's not Brad Pitt, right? Or, or whoever is cool these days, right? So this is a realistic painting. But this is unusual, and this is, a, this is something to think about. If you go to a museum, or if you look in other places where you have famous paintings of, of people, or statues, or whatever, what you see is not necessarily how they looked, right? Because many times, and practically most of the time, the artists were commissioned to, you know, take care of the blemishes, make me look taller, make me look more regal, all those kinds of things. Paintings of Napoleon riding across the Alps on a steed, a large horse, when in fact he rode on the back of a burro, right? Because it's just not practical to ride, you know. So they, it's just image versus reality. This painting of Cromwell is very famous because Cromwell said to the artist, according to the urban legend, he said to paint him accurately, warts and all. And supposedly that is where this phrase entered into the English language. So today's message is entitled, Portrait of a Congregation. So we want to be mindful from the beginning of the difference between a photograph and a portrait. You can find pictures all over this building. You can look in old church directories and see photographs that show what our congregation was like at any given time. And since this congregation was formed or established in 1851, right, nearly 200 years ago, that photograph has changed many times over the last two centuries. But that is not what we are doing here. So here we are trying to look at the congregation both as a whole but also as an ideal, not just how we want to be seen in terms of the past, but also what we aspire to be in the future. So this is the 10th message in our summer series on who we are, First Christian Church of Atlanta, as a church, uh, Christian Church Disciples of Christ congregation, also as a congregation here in Tucker, and so forth, but is really a portrait of who we aspire to be, not just in the past, but in the future. So I want to just show you a list of the messages that, that I have preached and just sort of give you a quick review, all right? The first message was entitled, We Seek to Be an Inclusive Congregation, followed by We Value Unity. Then We Seek to Be a Church for the 21st Century. We Value Cooperation, Not Competition. Number five, we believe in conversion. Number six, we, believe, we practice believer's baptism. 
Number seven, we value the Lord's Supper. Number eight, we, we have a mission. And last week, we believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The purpose of these messages has been to sort of paint a portrait of our congregation, to remind ourselves of who we are and what we do. Another outcome would be to tell the world a little bit about who we are and what we do, in case they're interested, in case they're curious. We give an account of who we are, and the third outcome would be with some, uh, some help from our elders. Could you see that being the uh, table of contents for a book? Yeah. So what we're doing is we're taking that and making it into a little booklet that the elders and I are working on together as a presentation of who we are. And you know, sometimes churches have these uh, membership classes to talk who we are, what, what we aspire to be, and people who are, who are interested. So if that's, what, if that's what we were going to do, that's what it would look like. So let's talk about each one of these very briefly. Uh, because remember, uh, Nick, I used to be a high school teacher. And I've always learned that after a series of lessons, you have to do a review, right? So that's what we're going to do today. First, we seek to be an inclusive congregation. In Galatians 3.28, sorry, yeah, Galatians 3.28, Paul wrote, There is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free. There is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. The church, according to the New Testament, is a diverse and inclusive, or is as diverse and inclusive as any group in the history of the world. So, um, it is no longer about identity, the identity markers that give us privilege. In the church, there are no identity markers that privilege one person over another. Why? Because as Paul writes, all are one in Christ. What makes us one is Christ, not erasing our identity, not denying who we are. What matters is that we are now in Christ. Second, we value unity. Lots of movements talk about unity, right? Everybody talks about unity. But for many people, unity comes with uniformity. We will have unity when you become like us. We will have unity when we conquer the whole world and everybody is under our government control. That is not unity as we understand it. For our movement, unity is about working together. And just like the message on inclusion, it is not about erasing what makes us different. It's about appreciating what makes us different. It's about the fact that what makes us different also makes us complementary. It makes us able to work together. What I lack, you possess. And what you lack, maybe I possess. And together, we fill out each other's needs. And that is another reason why we need the church. We need the body of Christ. The Christian church, Disciples of Christ, came out of many of the doctrinal squabbles of denominational Christianity. The early church only had one test of fellowship. And that test of fellowship was, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? That was it. To join the church, to be baptized, all of that revolved around what you believed about Jesus. This is what we ask of people. If they want to join the church, if they want to be baptized, we ask them, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? And if the answer is yes, that is all we, we require. Anything that goes beyond that goes beyond the New Testament. Thirdly, we seek to be a congregation for the 21st century. How? Well, let me suggest a few ways. One, we try to call people to faithfulness to Christ, not faithfulness to a denomination. I like to say that again because I think that's worth saying again. We call people to faithfulness to Christ, not faithfulness to a denomination. You know, many denominations are in decline today because denominational leaders focus their efforts on survival more than evangelism. Similarly, my second point is that we are focusing on our efforts of, of 
presenting Christianity as a movement more than an institution. Christianity really is both. It's an institution, but it's also a movement. The church stagnates when we get comfortable in an institution mentality. When we think of ourselves as established, and we're here, or we're just waiting for people to show up, that is stagnation. The problem of many churches in America, in my opinion, is that they act primarily as an institution. But there were two other points in that message that I emphasized that I'll mention briefly. We are involved in making our community better. People in the Tucker area know about our church. They know about our church because of the food drives. They know about our church because of all the other activities that we promote, including the Tucker Community Singers, but also uh, the food drives that we've done, the blanket drive, the so many other things that are involvement. We are value added to the community. And, and fourthly, we live in an age of mission. When you and I, most of us, were born, the only thing a church needed to do in order to grow was basically build a building and open the doors on Sunday morning and people would come. Now that may be a simplification, but it's not much of a simplification. It's really kind of the way things were. In this particular part of the country especially, but anywhere, if there was a church, if you build it, they will come. We now live in an age in which people are like, I don't think so, I have other things to do. I have, I, they may even think they have better things to do, or they may not even know what goes on within a church, right? We live in an age of mission. And in order to be a church for the 21st century, we have to realize that having a building and opening the doors is not the way to bring people to Christ. We have to go to where they are. We have to share the good news with them. The fourth message, we value cooperation, not competition. Much of our movement's work could be summarized as attempting to follow a New Testament form of faith and practice, but also seeking unity among all believers. One of the things I love about being a disciple, what I love about you, is that we have differences of opinions. And some of us, if we wanted to talk politics, if we wanted to talk a lot of other things, we could possibly get into a knockdown, drag out fight. We could probably turn this into a bar room brawl. I'm kidding, of course. But I'm saying that one thing I know about Disciples of Christ congregations is that we accept people that we don't agree with. Because we're really only required to agree that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior. To think that we have it all figured out is arrogance. To think that uh, one, one particular view is, is superior to another is probably nearsighted on our part. If we value unity, as we have been talking about, and if we believe that we are a mission for the 21st century church, we must also recognize that we do not stand alone. We may be the disciples of Christ's congregation in Tucker, but we cooperate with the Baptists, the Methodists, the Catholics, the uh, Presbyterians, and so forth. Most all of the churches here in Tucker all participate and contribute to networks. It's a wonderful organization, and, and they help us to help people who are truly in need, and they also help us to not help people who are just milking the system. When you see the slides, the announcement slides after the service, you'll see that we have a blanket drive. Uh, my good friend over at Holy Cross Catholic Church Marion Anandapa, who is the leader of the uh, Society of St. Vincent de Paul, which is a charity organization, is asking us to stockpile blankets for the wintertime. And we are doing that. We cooperate. I always love to say that First Christian Church of Atlanta does not compete with other churches like Burger King competes with McDonald's. There are enough people in this town who don't go to church that we could reach out to with the gospel that we don't need to try to steal people from other churches. We value cooperation and not competition. Fifthly, we believe in conversion. When we are converted, what are we converted to? 
The answer is simple. The gospel. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And with our conversion, we become part of the church, part of God's family. And it doesn't matter if we were the vilest of sinners or if we were just mediocre, you know, mamby-pamby, milk toast. I always want to use a milk toast in a sermon. There you go, right? No matter how good or how bad we were, when we are converted, we are converted to a saving relationship with Christ, which means that our lives are changed, that we are, we are made better because now we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and we are being sanctified and we are being led into a deeper relationship with our Lord. Number six and number seven, we practice believer's baptism and we value the Lord's Supper. So these two ordinances, the Lord's Supper and baptism, and by the way, that's our baptistry over there. Uh, some people don't recognize it or realize it, but actually, uh, if you were to go over there and stand on that ledge, you could fall into a pit. Okay, so if we fill it with water, we'll dunk you under and then you'll be saved. I'm kidding, of course. But uh, that's our baptistry. We practice believer's baptism and we have weekly observance of the Lord's Supper. This is very different from most Protestant denominations. Many of the early reformers, such as Luther and Calvin, objected to the sacramental system in the Catholic Church and therefore they de-emphasized the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. They became sort of like just symbolic gestures. In fact, sometimes when I talk with, with friends who are of other Protestant denominations, we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Sometimes they have this attitude like, well, won't you, won't it lose its meaning if you do it every Sunday? If you just do it, it becomes routine, it becomes habit, it becomes ritual. I'm like, does your spouse get tired of hearing I love you every day? I guess it depends on how you say it and whether you mean it or not. When we read the New Testament, what do we see? We see that whenever the church gathered, they broke bread. That was part of our scripture for today. We see that when someone came to believe in Jesus, they were baptized. So rather than seeing baptism and the Lord's Supper as simply symbolic gestures, we see it as part of our obedience to Christ and our continuity with the church of the New Testament. Again, one of our movement's goals is to try to practice a New Testament form of worship. And again, this is why the Lord's Supper and baptism received so much of our attention. Number eight, we have a mission. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, Jesus tells his disciples, go into all the world, preach the gospel, baptize, make disciples. I'm not sure why so many churches spend months and years crafting a mission statement. We are already have one. It was given to us there in the gospel. Go means don't keep the message to yourself. It means that if it is good news for us, it is good news for everyone, and we need to share it. Make disciples means to bring people to Christ. Baptize means to lead them beyond simply believing and understanding, but to a transforming relationship. You know, stepping into the water is like going into the grave. And coming up out of the water is like being resurrected. Teach means to nurture the gospel message in them and help them to understand it more so that they can go and make disciples and baptize and teach and so on. This takes time. It takes investment in relationships. And that's why a, a church, a congregation for the 21st century needs to spend time building those relationships. Number nine, we believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We have, in many ways, saved the best for last. In the years after Jesus ascended to heaven, if you read church history, you'll see that they spent years, actually a couple of centuries, really trying to understand what does it mean to say that there is one God but that Jesus is the Son of God and that the Holy Spirit is the indwelling presence of God. 
So we have all this, you've heard of the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed, the Council of Chalcedon, and so on. As a denomination, the first Christian church of Atlanta, sorry, as a congregation of the disciples of Christ, we affirm and teach that God has revealed God's self to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that is not to say that we have said everything that we need to say about God in that statement. That is not to say that we have truly comprehended God. It is only to say that this is how God has been revealed to us, and it is enough. We believe it, we affirm it, we teach it. This is what we believe to be revealed truth. These nine messages are like nine snapshots that create something of a portrait. But if a portrait is an idealized picture, it is, much, it is as much a picture of what we hope to be as a representation of who we are. We aspire to be what is shown in these nine messages, and sometimes we succeed. But part of the point of painting this portrait, I like all the P's here, part of the point of painting a portrait is not just to project an image, but also to inspire the cultivation of the ideal that we are presenting in our children, in our neighbors, in our friends, and so forth. And if we are honest with ourselves and with God, we must admit that we are always a work in progress, warts and all. There is always room for more people in the picture. You know, we may be posing for family pictures, but we like it when they grow, when we have more and more people in that picture. So if the portrait painted here is a compelling one, we invite you to join the family and help us to more fully fill out this image of the church being formed in the image of Christ. I have a slide up here uh, that basically is an invitation. Shows some footprints on it. Oh, leave it there. Leave it there, Saul. What, is the, what does it mean to join the church? The church is the body of Christ and refers to all believers in all places and times who follow Jesus. If you are a believer, you already belong to the church. We invite you to join our local congregation. You see the difference between church and congregation? We're not claiming to be the church. We are claiming to be a congregation. We are not the only church in town, but we are a congregation that makes a difference. We invite you to be a part of what we are doing to serve God and our community in this location. And so I invite you as we stand to sing our closing hymn, which is Amazing Grace, I invite you to come and make that confession of faith to join, uh, to unify with this congregation. Please stand as we sing Amazing Grace, verses 1 and 4. If you have not met Ron Rock, 
do not leave the building without meeting Ron today. Ron comes to confess his faith in Christ Jesus and to unite with our congregation in membership. I got to tell you, this man is a serious student of the Bible. And he's a very enthusiastic believer. And he has already uh, volunteered to spend the day with us at Tucker Day and has offered so much. It's a, truly a blessing. I'd like to invite our elders to come forward and to help me to receive Ron into fellowship with our congregation. Oh, there it is. I kept reaching in my pocket for this thing. Ron, we already know the answer to this, but in front of the, the congregation, the family of God, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes. We accept you into membership of the First Christian Church of Atlanta, and we are so thrilled that you have united with this congregation, and we uh, uh, know that it's going to be a wonderful and blessed time for us. Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this young man and for his life, his testimony, but also for his journey for the way he has sought you and the way you have responded. We pray you'll continue to bless his life and bless his work and his contribution to your service here in Tucker, Georgia. We thank you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to come at, and with the elders and to the uh, doorway and let everybody greet you on the way out. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Saul, would you please... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Announcement slide, please. Announcement slides, would you put those up there for just one second, please? There we go. Um, coming up, we have a new t-shirt, and we want to wear these for Tucker Day. We don't have them yet, they're on the way, and Robert Pecorino is the one responsible for making all this happen. I think it's a beautiful shirt. I think it's very eye-catching, and then we're going to sell them for $20, and some of that money pays for the shirt, and some of that money is going to go back to offset the expenses of our Tucker Day activities. Uh, that one's that next one, please. Uh, next Sunday, we are having a potluck lunch, and your elders will be getting in touch with you about that because our goal is to have uh, the elders sitting with the people that, they're, that are part of their shepherding groups and just get a little, little socialization going on there, so they will get in touch with you about that. Next slide, please. Again, we are collecting blankets. Uh, there are some, I believe, uh, our friend from St. Vincent de Paul and some Jesuits are doing some work downtown in the wintertime, and they're asking for new or gently used blankets. They're asking for tarps and, and things like that. We can talk about it later, but we have some already in the library. And on that note, it's a happy day. We had such wonderful music, a wonderful time of worship. Pray that it's been a blessing to you and a new addition to the congregation. The only thing that can make this better is lunch, right? Oh, that wasn't funny, was it? Oh, sorry about that. We'll have lunch next week. In the meantime, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another, in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.